and I would like to speak of the planets in the heart of the sun and especially about the role of latitude, the important role of latitude in the definition of Casimi. Have a look at this uh, NASA video, please. Okay. Okay, right. That was the astronomical transit of the planet Venus uh, across the face of the Sun on the 6th of June 2012 in a NASA video. This is a very rare occurrence. I mean that this visible transit is a very rare occurrence because it happens only when uh, the planet and uh, the Sun are in their inferior conjunction. Because if they are in their superior conjunction, the planet uh, passes behind the Sun and not in front of it. Um, in this case, uh, I say that it is rare because Venus will be in the same position only in December 2117. And that is me, instead, in a dressing gown <laughs> at 5 o'clock in the morning on my balcony at dawn, trying to catch the image of Venus with a smaller 3-inch refractor, projecting its image, the black spot you can see, um, on a white sheet of paper. That uh, visible transit was a spectacular example of what the Western tradition calls Casimi, <coughs> attributing wondrous power and force to the planet in that condition, in that position. And the purpose of my talk is to uh, examine uh, some different definitions of Casimi we can find in the traditional Western astrological literature to show that even if Lilly's, William Lilly's definition is generally used by horrorists, horror astrologers even today, that definition is far from being exact and should not be taken totally for granted. Both Western and Indian astrology acknowledge the sun as a giver of life. But the light and heat of the sun are so intense that it burns whatever planet comes too close to him. So a planet that is too close to the sun is said to be burnt and becomes totally invisible. And this is a serious debility. The planet is made weak by this position, this condition. A planet within 80 degrees in longitude from the center of the sun, in fact, is said to be combust, that is, burnt, totally invisible. And that critical distance that was prescribed by William Lilly is different according to the different sources. Some say 6 degrees or 7 degrees, or a different value according to the planet involved, or if the planet is occidental or oriental to the sun. Some uh, authors even use a time criterion to define uh, combustion. So they say that a planet is uh, said to be combust when it has been invisible for at least seven days when, while approaching the sun, or it will be invisible for other seven days it is uh, following the sun. But what are the effects of combustion? I said before that uh, combustion is uh, a form of weakness for the planet involved. Um, this uh, um, combustion, this weakness, will be worse if the combustion is uh, uh, in application, the conjunction is in application, rather than separating uh, from the sun. The combustion is often totally destructive for the planet involved, and it is for this reason that, uh, that uh, when we have a horary chart about health or illness or death, finding the significator of the patient approaching the sun, approaching combustion, if the sun is not a major significator in the chart, is almost always an unfortunate testimony. However, it is necessary to take into account uh, different uh, factors when we uh, judge uh, the weakness or uh, strength of a planet in this condition, especially when we judge a native uh, chart 
and even in honorary charts, there are some situations in which the, mm, the conjunction with the sun is not so negative, is not so dangerous. For example, in uh, honorees about uh, relationships, where the sun is the natural symbol of the male partner, finding the planet signifying the female partner, and even the presence of accidental or um, essential dignities can lessen the bad effects of a combustion of a conjunction with the sun. However, um, the general meaning of uh, this kind of conjunction is universally recognized. The planet is made, uh, is made weak by, by this position. A planet whose light is uh, hidden by the glare of the sun is obviously, obviously very, very weak. But which planets can be actually burnt by the sun? Abu Majar, uh, 9th century CE, claims that uh, the sun harms and burns moist Venus and moon um, most of all while the masculine and dry planets are less affected by the worst effects of combustion. I don't know if this uh, distinction that sounds uh, theoretically correct, perhaps, could be applied to nativities, perhaps, but it is quite obvious that in horary charts it is very difficult to find evidence of this distinction. Um, I some say, for example, that Mars, for example, because of its hot and dry nature so similar to that of the sun, cannot be burnt by the sun. Or even that Mercury, because of its proximity to the sun, is so accustomed to this conjunction that it is somewhat immune from the worst effects of combustion. I don't think that this distinction could be applied to horary charts, because whenever we find a main significator combust, if the sun, I repeat, is not another significator in the chart, the result is almost always unfavorable. I suppose that the principle involved here is more the invisibility of the planet rather than its uh, hot or dry temperament or nature. I mean that the light of a combust Mars is as invisible as the light of any other planet in the same position, and that is the crucial factor. We have also a um, debilitating zone that is uh, from 8 degrees to 17 degrees in longitude on both sides of the sun, which is less detrimental than uh, combustion and is called subradis in Latin or under the rays. But um, whether or not we want to distinguish between uh, a phase of combustion from being merely under the rays, remember that in both cases the planet is totally invisible and this means that the planet is actually weak. So it is no exaggeration to say that the sun in conjunction acts as a powerful malefic. On the contrary, if uh, proximity to the day luminary is harmful, sitting on his lap, protected in his arms, in perfect union with the sun, is a condition that identifies a free zone, uh, somewhat a heaven of peace, exactly in the center of the space attributed to combustion. This is the case only when the planet is exactly conjunct the sun, both by longitude and by latitude. Um, because the, the sun is the symbol, the natural symbol of the king, of uh, power, of success, so being uh, protected in the arms of the sun, being in the heart of the king, sitting on his throne together with the king, means of course having great power
So this is a, mm, this exultant condition is called in different uh, ways in traditional literature. It is called encardius or synodikos uh, by Greek writers, I mean by the Arabs, in Cordesolis by Latin writers, and is generally known uh, by early modern, even medieval writers and modern astrologers today as Kazemi. Ibn Ezra, a medieval author, a medieval astrologer, writes that when a planet is uh, under the rays of the sun, it is like a person in prison, while a planet that is burnt by the sun, combusted by the sun, is like a dying person. But speaking of a Kazimi planet, he says that it is like a person sitting on the throne with the king, sitting with the king in the same chair. But uh, the throne that uh, the Kazimi planet enjoys is not due to its qualities, its lofty virtues, its merits. It is only by virtue of benevolence and indulgence of those in power that that planet, or the person represented by that planet, of course, is there. So uh, the planet has the opportunity to temporarily only temporarily share the throne with the legitimate ruler, but that condition is anything but stable because astronomically speaking, both the planet and the sun continue to move along the ecliptic and at different speeds. And this means that when the planet moves out of the perfect conjunction, it loses the throne, it loses the power which was only conceded by the sun. It was not its own. And it is for this reason that this kind of dignity is called accidental, because it is not essential, it is not permanent. Among the authors who wrote about uh, this, uh, this condition of Kazimi, we find very different definitions. I think it is interesting to examine some of them, only some of them, of course, not only because it is interesting historically, but especially because we should try to find a definition which works, which could, we could apply to actual concrete horary charts. Sal bin Bishr, a Jew of Persian origins, 9th century CE, wrote in his introductorium that uh, the tenth condition of strength for the planets is when they are Kazimi, they are in the heart of the sun, meaning when they are within one degree of it. So using a whole degree is a prescription coming from Hellenistic uh, astrology. But eventually the Arab astrologers tended to restrict this limit uh, transforming it from a symbolical value into a visually determined and precise distance. As the apparent size of the disk of the sun as seen from Earth is about from uh, 30, 31 minutes and a half to 32 minutes and a half, being in the body of the sun, obviously means being within about 16 minutes from its center. And that is, in fact, the quantity prescribed by Guido Bonatti, who was a very famous medieval Italian astrologer, a great admirer of the Arabs, who wrote in his comprehensive treatise, Liber Astronomiae, that when the planet is with the sun in one degree, so that there are 16 minutes or less between them, both by latitude and longitude, which rarely happens, it is said to be united, and then it is made strong, because it is said to be in the sun's forge that is in his heart. But uh, eventually, in the following centuries, this uh, meticulous attention to the precision of the astronomical position uh, seemed uh, to fade, especially among the authors of the early modern era. 
So the great horrorist William Lilly, 17th century, was certainly not obsessed by the issue of latitude. And in fact, his definition of Kazimi doesn't take it into account. He simply says that uh, the planet must be within 17 minutes from the center of the sun, and that it is made wondrous strong in that condition, but he doesn't mention latitude. And we can be assured that he doesn't mean to speak of latitude in this case, because when Lily wants to say that latitude as well as longitude is important, he actually does so in a very clear and uh, explicit manner in his treatise, Christian Astrology, for example, when he speaks of the fixed stars. And it is no coincidence that uh, Guido Bonatti himself, uh, several centuries before, was already complaining about the lack of interest of his fellow astrologers in the question of, of latitude, saying that he was um, in accordance uh, with them, with his colleagues, only in part because, he said, if a planet is distant from the sun by less than 16 minutes in longitude, and according to latitude, it is distant by more than 16 minutes. Nevertheless, it is combust. So, who is right in his definition of Kazimi? Sahal, who speaks of a whole degree, or Guido Bonatti, who is much more exacting in his definition, speaking of only 16 minutes, both in longitude and in latitude. Or even William Lilly, who speaks instead of 17 minutes, but merely in longitude. Well, I think it is obvious that even if Lilly's method is the one generally used by all astrologers, or many astrologers even today, astronomically speaking, Bonatti's definition is more correct, more accurate, and the transit of an inferior planet, such as the visible passage of Venus across the surface of the Sun in 2012, I was speaking of before, can help us to understand and to visualize why. Because in that occasion, Venus was approaching the Sun. And while approaching the Sun, uh, she passed a condition of, uh, she was in a condition of invisibility, first under the rays, and then combust. But then, suddenly, it was visible again as a black, uh, small, round spot on the surface of the sun, crossing the surface from one side to the other, perfectly visible again, so not combust, hmm? perfectly visible, uh, either with um, astronomical uh, instruments or even to the naked eye, if at dawn. In that occasion, the latitude of Venus was only about eight minutes from the ecliptic, that means from the center of the sun, well within the prescribed 16 minutes. So Venus was actually in the body of the sun. Had uh, its latitude been different from that, Venus would have passed below the sun or above the disk of the sun without crossing it, totally invisible again, so it would have been combust. But is this um, superior precision of, the, of Bonatti's definition actually useful in concrete horary charts? I mean, is it necessary for us as astrologers to take latitude into account? Well, this is my first example. I tried to see the chart. Now, the question is, uh, shall I go to the Far East? And the querent in this case was a person who wanted to go on a sort of um, cultural and spiritual pilgrimage to the Far East, 
there were some problems for her. She wanted to know if she could finally leave or not. At the moment of the question, the um, uh, ascendant is in Libra. So the quarant is represented by the planet Venus, ruler of Libra, of course. The other main significator is Mercury, because Mercury rules the ninth house. And the ninth house is the house pertaining religion, voyages abroad, culture, learning. So a cultural and spiritual pilgrimage to the Far East is certainly a matter pertaining to the ninth house. The moon is, not, is of no use in this chart, unfortunately, because it is void, of course. Uh, she doesn't make any, any major aspect, and this generally means stagnation, lack of opportunity, of change, of movement, of action, and so on. So let's concentrate on the two main significators. Mercury. Mercury is in the strong 10th house of success, but it is peregrine, that is devoid of any essential dignity, retrograde, and if we admit, as we said before, that even Mercury can be combust as any other planet, this Mercury is actually combust by the sun. So this is not a promising start, but the position of Venus is much more interesting. Venus is in the 10th house, that is a strong house, peregrine, again. Venus is uh, conjunct exactly to the sun. There are, there are only two minutes in longitude between the two centers. And this means that according to the common definition of Kazimi by longitude, Lily's one, for example, this Venus is in the heart of the sun. So uh, in the heart of the sun, Venus is protected by the king. Uh, in this case, uh, the sun is also the lord of the mid-heaven. And uh, this exultant condition uh, could, be, um, could give some hope at least uh, to have um, a positive answer and um, to fulfill the dream of the quarant. But uh, have a look at the latitude of Venus. It is one degree 17 minutes to the north of the ecliptic. This means that it is beyond the limits prescribed by Bonatti. This means that Venus is not in the body of the sun. Venus is passing to the north of the sun, above the disk of the sun, completely outside of it. So Venus is combust, and in fact it happened that there was no pilgrimage, and the quarant never left, because the combustion of both significators prevents any possible uh, positive outcome. And this means that uh, Mercury can be as combust as any other planet, and that Venus in this chart, and that Venus in this chart, far from being protected in the heart of the sun, is actually burnt by it. So this is a missed Kazimi. This is my second and last example. With the Sicilian workshops be held, the quarant is a teacher who had been asked by the director of a cultural center in uh, Sicily uh, to, to hold uh, some workshops, some cultural seminars. There was great enthusiasm about uh, this project. And in fact, this chart is beautiful, I think. There are a lot of favorable testimonies. The quarant is represented by the moon because the ascendant is in cancer. And, and uh, the moon is uh, completing a sextile to Saturn. Saturn is the ruler of the ninth house of all cultural activities, so it signifies the workshops. So the perfection of this sextile could mean the realization of the project, of the plan. There are other uh, favorable testimonies in this chart. For example, the fact that Saturn is exalted in Libra in the strong angular fourth house. So the idea of these workshops is a really good one. They could be really interesting and successful. Uh, 
There is the part of fortune at the ascendant, although personally I think that this uh, testimony is not so important in, uh, in charts because uh, astronomically speaking, a part of fortune at the ascendant simply means that the sun and moon are conjunct. Uh, in the same way as a part of fortune at the descendant simply means that the sun and moon are in opposition. So the meanings of this position of the um, uh, part of fortune are summarized by the relationship in the relationship uh, between uh, the sun and the moon. Another important testimony is instead the presence of Jupiter in the 10th house. Jupiter is a benefic. It represents public success in this case. It is even more benefic because it is in its own domicile. And in the strong 10th house it rules. So this is another favorable testimony. But returning to the conjunction of the sun and the moon. This is an exact conjunction. There are only, only some minutes. So according to the classical definition of Kazemi, uh, the moon should be in the heart of the sun. In spite of the fact that sometimes we consider a moon approaching the sun um, a bit unfortunate because of its loss in light, it is not necessarily so. In fact, Bonatti says that when this conjunction is perfectly exact, both by latitude and by longitude, the quarant or the native are fortunate. But this happens only when the moon has got zero degrees of latitude, when the moon is on a node, when there is a solar eclipse. That means that the light of the sun is hidden by the moon S to the advantage of what is represented by the moon and the disadvantage or weakening of what is represented by the sun. In this case, instead, the moon has a latitude of 1 degree 45 to the south of the sun. And this again means that the moon is not crossing the sun, is not hiding the light of the sun, but he is hidden by the light of the sun because the moon is passing to the south of the body of the sun, completely outside its body. So this moon is not in the heart, that means in the body of the sun. This moon is actually combust. In fact, it happened that in spite of all the favorable testimonies in this chart and all the enthusiasm around this project, the project was not realized. So what are my conclusions at this point? Well, first of all, I cannot say that a few examples can be evidence, can be taken as evidence of a theoretical statement. Although I studied a lot of charts for this research, not only the two I can present here for reasons of time, of course. But first, we can draw some conclusions. First of all, that the definition of Kazimi derived from Lily and applied by some Western astrologers today is too wide and should be restricted. Second, that the role of latitude in the definition of Kazimi is fundamental and cannot be overlooked. And third, that the introduction of uh, latitude makes true Kazimi a very rare occurrence, even considering occultations, the perfect union of planets and the sun is a really extremely uncommon event. In the period from 20,000 to 2012, for example, it happened only four times to Mercury, twice to Venus, and once to Saturn and Jupiter. So these are my conclusions by now, but the research is still going on naturally. Thank you very much for your attention. Patricia, there's a question for you.
Okay, yes, uh, there was even uh, this uh, problem <laughs> in my relation, but I tried to, uh, to make it short as far as possible. Yes, when, the, when combustion... Yes, I confirm that this is so, that when combustion happens in the sign of the combust planet, mm, uh, the fats are less destructive. Sometimes they are even positive, it depends on the kind of chart, because the sun has power over the planet by conjunction and combustion, of course, but the planet has power over the sun as its dispositor, thus creating some sort of balance between the two. So the prognosis, you say, is more favorable in this case. Well, I don't know, I should analyze the chart, of course, but technically, if I, if I understand what you are saying, it is a combust mass. I think that there are a lot of problems to be solved about this idea of Kazimi and combustion. And I prefer to use not natal charts, not nativities, because I think that nativities are very complex to analyze. Human beings are complex to, to analyze, so it is not so easy to, to use uh, uh, fixed or simple rules uh, to, to define a, a very complex reality um, such as uh, is the human being. Um, I prefer to use horary charts in this case because they are simpler, less nuanced, and uh, more direct and evident in their conclusions and their results. So we, we, can, we can find evidence or what we, we, um, we search in horary charts, then applying the same to natal charts, I think, means being prudent and careful and uh, having a lot of common sense and knowledge of, uh, of people. 